Welcome back. I'd like to test out the keyboard circuit that we built in the last video. And so I have this um, PS2 to USB adapter that I bought at a secondhand shop for a couple of bucks. And I want to modify it in order to be able to connect the keyboard, a PS2 keyboard, up to our breadboard. So enjoy the jump cuts uh, watching me uh, assemble this connector. All right, so we need to um, put some sort of indicator on here. I think we'll just probably use uh, LEDs. All right, so let's populate our LEDs and put the anode to the left. And then finally, we're going to hook up the uh, 
block and data pins to the FPGA. All right, let's make a test so that we can uh, synthesize the keyboard. I'm going to switch this to binary. And we've got a validation LED on our breadboard, so let's add a valid pin. Now let's create our top level component. So we'll have um, input pins for block and data. And then we'll have pins for the various LEDs. And then we'll add our valid pin. Okay, let's synthesize this. And synthesis is running. Okay, it looks like synthesis is done. So let's see if we can load the design. First thing before I hit program, though, very carefully, leave the LEDs so that we can see all of those. And I'm now going to hit the program button. Let's see, here we go. So when I hit Z, I see nothing. And when I hit arrow, I see nothing. Well, that is disappointing. So we have some troubleshooting to do. So when troubleshooting this problem, um, first thing that I realized is that, uh, you know, if you recall, when we were doing the simulation testing, we had a clock wired up to the keyboard clock, a simulated clock. That way we could step the clock in simulation mode. However, our keyboard test is, of course, passing through the clock directly from the pin on the keyboard. Well, the problem with wiring it up like this, this is passing the internal clock to this, which, of course, is, is not correct at all. So what had to be done was the internal clock had to be removed. And also the inverter had to be removed because again, our keyboard clock from the from the actual keyboard pin is an inverted clock already. So that had to be taken off as well. And the keyboard input wired directly to the tunnel. But that still did not solve the problem. And uh, I looked and looked and looked and I finally came to realize if we go look at the scan code, component. Um, you'll notice here that this, on the, on the shift register, this uh, pin right here, it says shift is disabled when zero. Now under simulation, the shift register worked just fine. However, when I was, you know, looking through all of the schematics, trying to figure out what the heck could possibly be wrong when synthesizing versus simulating, I realized that I did not have this pulled up to high. And I thought, well, hmm, I wonder if that has something to do with it. Well, sure enough. Uh, and I, I would consider this a 
Logisim bug that under simulation, it assumes that this pin is high, but during synthesis, synthesis must pull this down to low, which means the shift register is not shifting any bits in when the clock is clocking them in. So once I did that, uh, and then of course, once I had the voltages working, which we'll talk about in a second, then everything started working. So let's talk alert electrical characteristics. So if I measure the resistance, I'm on, I'm on resistance ohms in my multimeter. If I measure resistance across the positive supply pin, and I pick either the data or the clock line, which are the, are these, uh, these green or yellow one, or green or white wires, and I measure the resistance, you can see that I've got 900 ohms, uh, I guess you would call that a pull-up resistor, between the positive supply and uh, the white wire is the what? Is the, that's the data, the data line. Likewise, if I measure this across the green wire, same thing. I've got a 900 ohm pull-up resistor, which means that these two uh, pins, when they're connected to the, VG, to the uh, FPGA, they're going to be showing uh, positive 5 volts, because this is, a, this is a 5 volt keyboard, and I've tried this to operate at 3.3 volts, and it will not operate at 3.3 volts. It'll only operate at 5. But we don't want to present 5 volts to these pins as inputs into the FPGA, so we're going to need some sort of voltage shift um, circuit in order to be able to, to do that. So I'm going to model for you what the uh, keyboard looks like uh, coming out of its uh, data or clock pin. So we have a 5 volt supply. that is pulled up, the pin is pulled up with a, a 900K resistor that we measured. And there's a transistor that's um, switching this voltage on and off. The pin, you know, the pin is coming off of this node right here. But instead of a transistor, let's just put a switch in here because I think that'll be easier to play around with. So let's see here. Now switch is S, makes it easy. So here's our switch, and then we need a ground. Right, so our, our pin comes off of this node right here, which is going to be 5 volts on either the clock or the, or the data signal. Now, the thing about it is we want that 5 volts level shifted to 3.3 volt, volts because that's what our FPGA accepts. It uh, won't accept 5 volts. So let's go ahead and draw the 3.3 volt supply that is provided by the FPGA because we're going to, uh, we're going to tie into that. And we'll make this 3.3 volts. And so we're going to need or want a current limiting resistor, first of all, of some arbitrary value. So I'm just going to draw one for now. It might be, you might be tempted to do something like this to form kind of a voltage divider. But what will wind up happening, this is a 5 volt supply. In fact, I can go ahead and run this and watch what happens. Oh, I need to put a ground. Let me add a ground over here. And let's put a voltmeter so we can look at uh, this node right here to see what voltage we get.
So when I turn this off, I get 4.15 volts. And more importantly, um, you can see that our current is actually flowing back into our power supply because this is a, this is a 3.3 volt supply and this is a 5 volt supply. So right away, we don't definitely do not want this behavior. And let's go ahead and change these values though. So we're going to change this to 900 ohms because that's what I that's what we measured on the keyboard. And if we wanted this to be 3.3 volts, we could probably reduce the size of this resistor to something less than 1k. Let's try 500 just for grins. And you can see we get the voltage down. I bet if we put something like 220 ohms. So now we've got the volt. 3.6 volts is probably within range of what the FPGA would tolerate. So this circuit would work, except you'll notice that we've got current flowing back into the 3.3 volt supply. So we most certainly do not want that. How is it that we can prevent that from happening? Well, what we could do is we could put a diode because it's it's okay when we turn it off. Uh, it's okay for the current to flow this direction, but it's definitely not okay for it to flow this direction. Let me slow the speed down too, just because it's a little bit a little bit fast. Uh, yeah, so see, it's definitely okay for the current to flow from here down through here. That's not a problem, but it is most certainly not okay. Let me speed this up a little bit for the current to be flowing in this direction back through the supply. So, what we can do is put in a diode going in that direction. Now, we want to measure our supply, our, our pin, not from here, because this is going to be 5 volts. We want to measure it from this node right here. So let me remove this. Now I have this reversed. Um, positive, let's see, can I flip it? Swap terminals, yeah, that's what I want. Great. So now, voltage or current is only going to flow in this direction. When I close this, uh, and let me slow this down. So when I close this, you can see that we have a low voltage, 578 millivolts which is not zero, but it should be low enough in order for the FPGA to register a logic zero. And when I open this, now I get 3.3 volts, right? Now, there's really no reason at this point to put this 220 ohm resistor here because this basically takes a lot more current than is really necessary. You can actually see the current down here of this node. Uh, being 12 milliamps, we can make this resistor a whole lot less. Like, say, 10K. Achieve the same thing. Now the current is much, much lower. As you can see, it's, in, it's now measured in the microamps. Uh, it reduces our... Uh, low our, our low voltage to 384 millivolts. And as you can see, we get 3.3 volts uh, when the switch is open. So this behavior now seems to work exactly like we want with, the, with one final exception. And you're not going to be able to see it on this um, simulation, but when this transistor turns off and on, uh, there's a little bit of inductance which causes a voltage spike whenever the voltage transitions from high to low. An overshoot and an undershoot when the switch opens and closes, which is possible to damage the FPGA. This, you know, remember, this is the FPGA that's connected here. So to, to, to dampen that, 
What we can do is we can add a capacitor here. And so you might ask, well, what value of capacitor? Well, you can use some electrical engineering and uh, figure out how fast you need that to operate. Um, but through trial and error, I determine that 220 picofarads was just the right amount. So with this circuit now, we should be able to implement uh, both the data and the clock signals with the keyboard connected to the FPGA. So here I've got the circuit connected and you can see that we've got two diodes and we've got two 10K resistors here. And there's these two 220 picofarad capacitors connected to the pins uh, on the FPGA. And so when I punch the Z key, you can see that we get the correct ASCII code showing up on the LEDs. And you can also see very nice waveform. This is the data. This is the clock. And these are, you know, very nicely shaped with no overshoot and no undershoot. And this is on the, uh, the two volt scale. So actually, let's turn on. measurements so we can see that the maximum voltage is 3.3 volts the minimum voltage is 400 millivolts which is right around exactly what we measured on the schematic is about 384 millivolts um, but more importantly you can see that the uh, pulses are being translated correctly and even when I put in shift I get the appropriate code there when I put in the left arrow you can't see me I'm pushing it but you can see the left arrow coming on because those are the three codes that I have loaded into the ROM. Um, so let's uh, just for completeness sake, let's take off the capacitors. So this is what the waveform looks like with the capacitors on. And let me take these capacitors off. Now here's what the waveform looks like with the capacitors off. So you can see, you know, you can see these peaks here, overshoot, and you can also see that the Vmax is 3.8 volts. So um, definitely, you know, probably half a volt higher. It's still within tolerance probably of the FPGA. Uh, and, you know, obviously you can see it's still working. Nothing is blown up, but, you know, it's just good practice to try to keep the uh, voltages within specification of what's required. If you'd like to see more content about building the hack computer on an FPGA using Logisim, you can help my channel out by subscribing and liking the video. Link below you'll find the next video in the series.